And I am delighted to be here virtually. Um, and I'm very excited about the Mars Perseverance mission. And uh, you'll hopefully hear that in my voice and towards the end of the pre presentation. Um, I've got some um, links for where you can watch the landing um, and uh, the EDL entry, descent, and landing um, live. And also, um, even though it's called Perseverance, the mission itself is Mars 2020. The lander is called Perseverance. And a lot of people have been referring to it as Percy. So you might hear me slip and call it Percy a few times. It's kind of a cute name and uh, Perseverance doesn't quite roll on the tongue. And I've got a PowerPoint. I've also got three videos. If you've got questions, just type them in the chat and um, hopefully we'll be able to answer them later. I am a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador and that's a volunteer position. Um, for my day job, I am the planetary manager at the Museum of York County. And as part of my job, I answer questions from the public. So if you have a question um, that you send me, that you email me, it's my job to try and answer you in 24 hours. So keep that in mind. You're not um, impinging on me in any way. It's C. Holmberg at CH Museums plural.org. And the mission, the Mars 2020 mission, um, it should last at least one Mars year, which is about two Earth years. And it, its job, it's got a number of um, aims. One is to look for signs of ancient life. They don't think Mars is good for current life, but there could be ancient microbial life on Mars and Perseverance's job is to try and find it and try and send samples. It's the first leg of a mission um, to actually bring samples back to Earth from Mars. Um, it's also going to characterize the geology and climate, see what Mars was like in the past, what Mars is like right now, and help pave the way for human exploration. It's got a weather station aboard, and it also has some proof of concepts that it is going to try and figure out what um, human exploration could be on Mars. Now, NASA's plan is eventually to send humans on Mars. It's going to be at least 2040 before that happens. So if you think about where you would be in 1920 years, and perhaps you could be one of the first people on Mars, you could be the first person on Mars, which is pretty exciting if that's what you want to do. Of course, a round trip to Mars even now takes about nine, it takes about nine months each way. Um, a round trip would be about two years, two and a half years. And this right here is the first leg of a round trip because the hope is that Perseverance is going to collect samples, which another mission is going to um, launch back into Martian orbit. And then finally, a third mission of Martian orbiter will bring those samples back to Earth. Um, and now is my overview video. I am, for the videos, I think I'm going to, I don't think I can, that won't work. All right, I'm going to break free and try to um, go to the YouTube. Let me stop sharing and then reshare with the YouTube and hopefully that will work. Um, share, I don't see my share, my share is at the bottom and 
Mission Overview, Mars Perseverance. Okay, can y'all see it? And let me start the video. You know, Mars is the closest place that we can reach with robotic exploration that we think had a really good chance of having ancient life. The Perseverance rover will land at a location called Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater is a very interesting place. It's a crater that once held a lake. There are a lot of craters on the surface of Mars that could have once hosted ancient lakes. Not every crater that we think had a lake actually preserves evidence that that lake was there. It had an inflow channel and it had an outflow channel. That means it was filled, the crater was filled with water. In Jezero, we have probably one of the most beautifully preserved delta deposits on Mars in that crater. This is a wonderful place to live for microorganisms, and it is also a wonderful place for those microorganisms to be preserved so that we can find them now so many billions of years later. There is no other place on Mars that has the unique combination of a lake setting, a beautifully preserved delta, and the diverse mineralogy that we have in Jezero Crater. So it's truly a special landing site. The major goal of the Perseverance mission is to investigate astrobiology on Mars, and in particular, to address the question of whether life ever existed on Mars. The Perseverance rover starts with a design that's very similar to Curiosity, but we've added to it a whole new set of science instruments. And these science instruments were purposefully selected to help us in the search for biosignatures. We're gonna be taking uh, microphones with us for the first time we're gonna have uh, that human sense on another planet. Perseverance carries with her a grand experiment in space faring technology, a helicopter, the name of which is now Ingenuity. One of the major upgrades that Perseverance has from Curiosity is that it's able to self-drive for a distance of up to 200 meters per day. As the rover is driving, it's literally building the map of the road it's driving on on Mars. Scientists for years have told us that to really unlock the secrets of Mars, we have to bring samples from Mars back to Earth. So what Mars 2020 is going to do is to drill samples, put them in small tubes. We're gonna seal it in its own individual tube. We set them on the surface to provide a target for the second two missions, which hopefully will get in development in the next several years and could potentially get the samples back to Earth by 2031. Perseverance is a very, very profound first step in both our understanding of our place in the universe and a stepping stone towards human exploration of Mars. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can share my PowerPoint again. Hopefully you were able to see that and such. And let's go back to share screen and pick up on the PowerPoint. And from current slide. Okay, so the rover was actually named by a seventh grader and uh, he wrote an essay and he won. Um, so Perseverance seems like a perfect uh, name, especially with the pandemic. And you can see here some of the instruments that it has. Um, it's got 29 cameras. So it's gonna take lots and lots of pictures um, and a whole bunch of scientific instruments. And let me go to the next one. Now the marsh, the mission goals, um, it's going to study Mars's geology to see if it's where it might be capable of supporting microbial life or had been capable. Um, it's going to seek signs of fossils and what you see there in the little picture is a stromatolite. Um, stromatolite means layered rock. And those were the, the first 
evidence of life that we saw on earth and more about that later. Um, it's going to seek signs and evidence of life that was on Mars. And it's the first mission to do that. And when it brings them back samples, you know, that's how we're going to determine for sure. It's going to bore into the rocks and collect samples. Um, they used to call the soil, the the soil samples regolith. And I learned when I was school that something had to have organic material to be called soil. Well, the definition, the geologist's definition of the word soil and has now changed. And so regolith, the um, dirt that's on Mars and the moon can now be called soil. And mostly, or lastly, to prepare for humans. It's going to uh, have a weather station and one of its missions, one of its experiments, Makisi is looking to create oxygen out of the carbon dioxide in Mars's atmosphere. So pretty lofty goals, but very, very exciting. Um, Perseverance mission launched in July last year. Um, it takes about nine months to get there and Mars and Earth line up every two years or so. So things launch to Mars every two years or so. Not only is the United States got a lander, um, the Chinese have a lander that they're sending and the first um, orbiter on Mars from the um, UAE, from the air world is also arriving on Mars um, as well. So lots of missions, three missions planned right now. And we can in two years launch another mission to Mars. It's just the planets line up and it saves on fuel. Now, Perseverance, carries a few little special things. And one of them is a COVID plate to thank the medical community. It's a three inches by five inches. And there's uh, what it looks like. Um, and it's on the outside of Perseverance because without the medical community and first responders, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Okay, and the travel to Mars after launch Earth at launch, I don't know if you can see my cursor, Earth at Mars was right here, and there was Mars kind of ahead of Earth. Mars being an exterior planet, it moves a little bit slower. One revolution, one year on Mars is about two years on Earth. And so um, when they meet, it will be over here, on the 18th, on Thursday. Um, you can see there's a number of course corrections that's just because uh, land, arriving on Mars is hard. Um, um, the course corrections, one, two, three, and then these little ones, just a little nudge if needed, um, TCMs. Um, just to make sure that it gets where we want it to go. Now, it used to be when they did the Spirit and Opportunity and before that the Viking landers, um, you could land on Mars with, with airbags. You, they could just bounce, but Perseverance is too heavy for that. The chassis, the outside is very similar to is the same as the chassis for Curiosity, um, but it's got different instruments. Um, it's got, it weighs over a ton. It's got 50% more payload than Curiosity. And it's also got some computers to make it more autonomous. For the first time, it's gonna have, it's a, uh, Mission to Mars is going to have microphones, two microphones, so we can hear what it sounds like as it lands and what Mars sounds like in stereo. And it's also got cameras to help it land. So there are 
cameras on the lander are looking up at the parachute. There's cameras on the parachute looking down at the lander. There's parachutes on the lander looking down at Mars as it lands. So we will be able to watch it land and we will also be able to hear it land. Now it's got to do all of this on its own. Once it, land, it's, it uh, arrives at the Martian atmosphere, it takes about seven minutes to land. That's called the seven minutes of terror, but it takes light 11 minutes to reach us from where Mars is right now to Earth. So by the time we, we see or hear the signal, it will already have been have landed. It, it's too late. Now, Seven Minutes of Terror is a video that explains about the 420 seconds or so um, it takes between it arriving at the atmosphere and landing. And this one was done by Curi um, for the Curiosity mission. Curiosity, remember, has the same outside as Perseverance, and it's going to land um, in pretty much the same way. And it's all about landing in a way to, to, to actually stop gently in a safe place. And I'm going to run that YouTube video. It's about a five minute video for seven minutes of terror. Um, but that's what they describe it. And let me find. There we go. Hopefully that runs. Hopefully you can see this. We cannot. Okay. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Stop share. And I am going to um, go and find it. on the internet. Oh, it is on the internet. Um, let me stop share and then reshare and hopefully that will work. Whiteboard, seven minutes of terror. Can you see it? Oh, can you see it now? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna start it up. And this, remember, is curiosity, but Mars Perseverance will land in the same way. Uh, it looks crazy. It's a very natural thing. Sometimes when we look at it, it looks crazy. It is the result of reasoned engineering thought. But it still looks crazy. The top of the atmosphere down to the surface, it takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away. So when we first get word that we touch the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive and dead on the surface. Entry descent and landing, also known as EDL, to refer to as the seven minutes of terror, because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars, going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over. We slam into the atmosphere and develop so much aerodynamic drag, our heat shield, it heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun. 1600 degrees. <coughs> Doing entry is equal to not only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding it like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow constraint space. This is one of the biggest challenges that we're facing and one that we have never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down. 
because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about a thousand miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. When it opens up that fast, it's a neck snapping nine Gs. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it will only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice, but we've got to cut it off. And then come down in rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, we don't do something, we're just gonna smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical diver fly off to the side, diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar and see where we're going to land. And we head straight down to the bottom of the crater, right beside a six kilometer high mountain. We can't get those rocket engines too close to the ground because if we were to descend propulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. The dust cloud could then go and land on the rover. It could damage mechanisms and it could damage instruments. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky crane. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long and then gently deposit it on its wheels, on the surface. As the rover touches down and is now on the ground, the descent stage is in a collision course with the rover. We must cut the bridle immediately and fly the descent stage to a safe distance from the rover. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing so I can uh, share my PowerPoint yet again. Um, that is all what is going to happen on Thursday. So that's EDL. Um, and EDL is, um, let me get to where we should be going. EDL means entry, descent, and landing. And that is what's going to happen at on Thursday um, afternoon. And you can watch all of that um, kind of live. Um, okay, so part of, I just wanted to kind of share what um, was happening. Um, it hits the atmosphere um the mars 2020 at over 12,000 miles per hour it then it heats up and so it's going to come it's going to look like a, a meteor um and it's going to use thrusters to try and steer towards jezero crater it deploys a 70 foot diameter supersonic par parachute and it's supersonic because it's still traveling two times the speed of sound. It needs to jettison its heat, sh heat shield, which is uh, kind of kept it cool enough um, so it can use its cameras to figure out where it is. It's still going 150 miles per hour when the, when the parachute is jettisoned. And that's as fast as a skydiver with no parachute. And then it fires up its engine and slows down to about a mile and a half per hour. And then it's still too fast for all those delicate instruments. And then it uses the sky crane, which 
touches and it, it lowers it along that sky crane and it touches down at slower than walking speed. And it's got to do that, I want to emphasize again, with no earth help whatsoever, because by the time we, we see it, it's already landed or crashed or whatever it's going to do. Um, now, new for Mars 2020 is it's got a new landing technique, which is going to help it land um, in a smaller ellipse. Um, it's going to take photos and compare them to and to see where it is and compare it to what it thinks it's going to see and divert if necessary. Um, they did this in California um, and kind of held the Mars Perseverance uh, um, on a helicopter um, to see how well that did. And the whole hope is that it's going to land in a much smaller ellipse that is going to be much more accurate than Curiosity because there's a cliff um, nearby and it doesn't want to land there. Um, it, it, they just want to be safe. Um, and so Perseverance will descend via sky crane. The crane just lowers it um, as a final st um, stage. You can see on here it's got the thrusters and the thrusters will will keep it going down and that will keep it from to, to gent land gently from a mile and a half per hour. Okay, and then a little bit about the landing site, Jezero Crater. And here is um, Jezero Crater in a long shot. There, there is where it is on Mars. And this big basin that you see is called Insidious, Insidious um, Impact Crater, and that happened basin, and that happened uh, by a crater about 3.9 billion years ago. And Jezero is this little thing right here, so it's pretty small in this particular picture. Now that this is a blow up of that. So here is Jezero Crater. And they think that Jezero was an ancient lake. Um, they think that it filled in with water because it has both an inlet and an outflow. So they think that it filled with water, flowing water. And they can see a little bit over here to the left what looks like an ancient delta. And that is what is so exciting. Um, they think that a delta is a place that has a lot of Earth life. So they, they hope that it will have um, ancient Mars life. And so this shows um, the, the, the um, Jezero crater kind of um, at least a bit of it. And this is from one of the orbiters, Mars Express. And um, ESA, ESA is the European Space Agency. So this is from a European orbiter. So you can see what they think is an inflow and the delta where sediments were deposited. Um, here's kind of a false color. So you can see Jezero Crater, the landing ellipse is um, in white and it's much smaller than Curiosity's landing ellipse, inflow, outflow. And then this one to the right is kind of false color coded and um, it shows where they think that the smectite are, are clays which form in water and the, the carbonate um, might also is um, forms in water. So they're, they're looking at this delta, delta and they see water and possibly signs of life. Now, just because Mars was once habitable 
does not mean that it was inhabited. There's a difference. So we think that long ago Mars was habitable, that it had water and the other things that life need before the climate changes. Now, whether they find life or not, no one knows. But even if they don't find evidence of life, that means that perhaps life was is much less common than originally thought. And, and that's a finding of itself. Okay, and here is from another mission. This is uh, from another orbiter. This is uh, kind of on its side a little bit, but it's another photograph. Um, Jezero Crater once held a lake about 30 miles across. They keep saying that about the size of Lake Tahoe. Well, JPL, they're all in California, but I don't know anything about Lake Tahoe or the, the, the size of it. Um, Mars today is cold and dry. It does not have liquid water on its surface. It, it doesn't have a lot of air. The thin atmosphere on Mars is about one one hundredth of the atmosphere on Earth. Um, and any lake or water that was there is long gone. Um, this is from, not from Mars, but from Alaska. And you can see a, a runoff in Alaska. And these are places that are teeming with life on Earth. So that's why they want to go and look at this delta. Now, I really like this terrestrial biological timeline because it shows um, the arrow on the left is where Mars climate change about three and a half billion years ago. Mars originally, Earth and Mars formed about four and a half, 4.7 billion years ago. And Mars was once very much similar to Earth, but the climate changed. And that climate changed after the first life forms developed on Earth. And so you can see photosynthesis, which is spelled wrong right about here. And Mars climate change was afterwards. So there may be microbes, single celled, um, organism on Mars. There certainly were on Earth that long ago. Fossils like fish and dinosaurs and, and other things, multi-celled, have been long after that. You can see right over here at about 55, um, 550 million years ago, 0.5 billion. Um, so we're not going to see things like Martian fish or sharks or even trilobites or insects, I don't think. Um, but they are going to look for microbial life on Mars. These are stromatolites. Stromatolites are arguably the oldest evidence of life that we have on Earth. Some stromatolites are over three and a half billion years old on Earth. They are found worldwide, the ancient ones. There are a few places where they still exist. Um, this one is from Western Australia, Shark Bay. Um, but we don't see a lot of them. I mean, looking at these things, how would you know that they are fossils? Um, you've got to analyze them a little bit better. Um, but the Mars Perseverance is going to look for lumpy things that look like this, because these are Earth stromatolites. And if Mars was similar to Earth long ago, maybe life formed on Mars very similar. What stromatolites are? are cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, and they are early photosynthesis. So they, they form at the very top on the surface and they push rocks that might fall on them, soil, downwards. So they layer 
upon layer with living ones on the surface and older ones underneath. They're kind of like corals. If you know how corals form, there's the living polyps and um, on the surface and inside are the dead corals. Uh, and the further down you go, the older they are. Um, Mars Perseverance is going to take core samples of these things. So scientists on Earth can analyze them and see if one of them is fossilized microbe, microbes. Um, the needs of a living organism are water, energy, uh, nutrients, and a decent environment. We do not know of any life on Earth that has happened without liquid water. Um, so because Mars has liquid water once, we think that we think that it was habitable. Um, so they want to look um, likely places to look nearer in bodies of water, near heat sources, geothermal heat sources on Earth um partially melted subsurface ices so um that's what they're going to look for um you can see classic fossils on the left we don't expect to find anything like these biosignatures is what they call these things like um stromatolites which um on the right so that's what it's looking for this is a cutaway of a Earth stromatolite. And you can see about the size of it, about 10 of those is a centimeter. We have some stromatolites at, at my museum that were from Western Virginia. Um, you really do find them worldwide. Um, lumpy, humpy shapes and layers of what you expect to see. All right, now for the, the instruments. I wanted to mention the instruments. Mars, Mars 2020 Perseverance is about car size. And it's got an arm on the end of it. It weighs a little bit more than a ton on Earth. Of course, the Martian gravity is only about a quarter of the Earth gravity, so it's only going to weigh about 500 pounds on Mars. Um, and so that's about the size of it. It's the biggest thing that we have ever sent, the heaviest, and it's got all kinds of new instruments. Um, it's going to, it's not an instrument, but it's going to use its arm to drill into the surface of Mars it's got some 40 tubes, um, hermetically sealed tubes. It's gonna use some of them for reference samples, but about 40 of them were, are going to pick the best Mars samples to bring back to Earth. Perseverance is not capable of bringing them to Earth. It's gonna just cache them. It's gonna put them somewhere where hopefully we can remember where it is, even if there's dust storms or other things. And then in 2026, a second rover, a fetch rover is going to collect them and put them on a rocket. And they are going to go into Mars's orbit. And then a third rover or a third orbiter, a third mission is going to take the samples from the orbiter for safe delivery to Earth. It's going to be in the 2030s before something arrives. And once again, think about where you'll be in, or how old you're gonna be in 2030. And maybe some of you will be looking at the first Martian rocks. Yes, we do get a few meteorites, which they think are from Mars, but they've undergone a lot. And so this is a perfect way to find out if there could be fossilized life on Mars. Um, and then we've got the sample caching video, but I'm not going to run that. Basically, it takes from the arm 
drills a hole and um, puts it in its belly and then it will deposit them somewhere safe, about 40 samples. Okay, and the, the instruments, we've got 29 cameras, as I mentioned, and I'm gonna talk about some of them. Sherlock and Watson are on, and Pixel are on the arm. It's got um, its primary cameras right here, the two from MassCam Z because it's the stereo and um, Mita is its weather station. Rim fax is underneath um, to penetrate using radar the, the ground and Moxie is down and going to try and manufacture oxygen on Mars. And there's the helicopter, which is un in the belly um, underneath. Talk about that. Um, MassCam Z right here, the two, the two little cameras. It's gonna take color 3D images and videos and it will be able to zoom in and see the structure of rocks a football field away. And then SuperCam, SuperCam is, uses a laser to pulverize the material and then take a picture of the dust that, that, that it pulverizes to identify the composition of rock. Um, pixel. Pixel is going to um, look and see um, what rocks are made up of, see if there's any organics, submillimeter. Um, so it's a very intense X-ray camera. Um, we've got Sherlock, and Sherlock will be looking at the composition, the fine scale composition of what the rocks are made of. And if we got Sherlock, of course, we have to have Watson, which is the camera that goes with Sherlock. Very, very close work. And Sherlock, Watson, and Pixel, the three, the three instruments on the robot arm um, work together. Um, Sherlock detects, detects organics and Pixel figures out the chemical composition of things. And we're gonna see how I'm doing for time. Pretty good, um, nearly finished. RIMFAX, they have, um, they use acronyms for everything. Um, RIMFAX is actually the first um, instrument that's gonna look for subsurface water on Mars. It's gonna use radar to do that. And Mita, every single Mars instrument has had a weather station. We are very interested if Mars is survivable in different places for life. So temperature, humidity, um, and other things about the atmosphere. And Moxa, Moxie, Moxie is one of the proof of concepts. We think we can make oxygen from the thin carbon dioxide air of Mars. Remember, it's one one hundredth of Earth's atmosphere. Um, and oxygen is important not only for people to breathe, but for rocket fuel. So if we want to launch back to Earth from Mars, especially if humans are going to go, um, it's very expensive to ship oxygen two ways and better if we can create it some on, on Earth, on Mars. And so here's the instruments again. And when I watched one of the webinars, they said, which one is your favorite? Um, I kind of like MassCam Z because of the 360 um, videos and, and color stereo images it can make. Um, but different people have different pre preferences. Um, one thing that's completely different are the wheels. Curiosity's wheels got very torn up and it can't go as far or as fast anymore. Perseverance is gonna have to drive three times faster 
than curiosity because it needs to collect and uh, find samples. So the wheels have been completely rebuilt and uh, I'm not, not a, one someone who knows a lot about wheels, but um, rather than the, the grooves, it's got straight things. Um, but they've been testing them and they think the wheels will hold up a little bit later, uh, better. And then Ingenuity. Ingenuity was named by a high schooler. She, uh, her name was Vanessa. Um, and Ingenuity, they didn't know if a helicopter could fly on Mars, but they think it will. It is resting in the belly and it will be dropped off to fly. It's about four feet, um, four pounds, I'm sorry. It's got a four foot rotor and it has to go, the rotor has to be wider than an earth rotor and it has to be about 10 times faster um, to fly. And they tested this um, in the vacuum chamber. They, they, they pumped out most of the air so they could simulate Mars's atmosphere. And they also put it on tethers so it could simulate Mars's gravity. And sure enough, they can get lift on this thing. It's a proof of concept. So it's only going to fly about 10 times. It's only going to fly about a minute to 90 seconds at a time. And it's never going to go more than a mile from um, Perseverance. It's solar powered. It's got cameras. And hopefully it can scout out things that Perseverance couldn't see. Um, okay, how to watch. NASA usually gives educators a private channel, but not this time. So they say that if you watch on YouTube, about 87 million people can watch simultaneously. So the best thing to do in case your internet gets bloggy is if you can get NASA TV and you can watch on your TV um, not internet, um, but if you got to go internet, um, the NASA governor, uh, NASA.gov has three channels, but YouTube is going to be really clear. Um, they hope if YouTube bugs up, um, you of all the channels that they use, the, um, I was told Ustream is the one that has the least traffic. So my, my fourth option there is, is Ustream. It's also going to be available on Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, um, and a few other things. I don't know what some of those are. I'm old. Um, but it's going to be on LinkedIn. And um, NASA itself has four channels that you can watch it. Now, some of, you can also watch on your phone, either Android or um, Apple, um, and you can find apps at the very bottom. So lots of ways to watch. Hopefully everybody can watch it. Um, the broadcast starts at 1.15 on Thursday. And they think um, it's going to land at about, let's see, I've got the next slide. They think that it's going to land at about 2.55 um, Central. So you can watch it. Um, you can watch it from 1.15. They also from 1.30, if, if some of you are, are Spanish speakers, um, they'll also do a live Spanish language broadcast. Um, EDL starts at about the procedures start at, at 2.38. Um, remember, it's seven minutes of ter terror, so it's going to be about 2.48 that it's going to actually enter the atmosphere. And then later that day, after 4.30, um, they're going to have a news conference, and they can tell you how successful it was or how sad we all are. Hopefully, everything will go and fun. I'm fine. And then just a shameless plug. Um, I am speaking tomorrow at one on our Facebook live channel at 
our museum, Museum of York County. If you've got any questions that you don't want to email me, you can always see my my very bad Facebook Live um, presentation. I'm really not good with it, and with the I'm going to be connecting to OBS for the first time. We'll see how that goes. And that is pretty much it. And uh, hopefully there's time for questions. Guys, if y'all have any questions, you can actually type them into the chat and I'll read them out. Or if you want to unmute yourself, you're welcome to ask your questions to Carol. While anyone's chatting, uh, Carol, I just want to say thank you so much for coming out and taking time from your busy day to kind of explain a little bit more about the mission for us. I know we're really excited um, for Thursday's mission. Um, so we have a question. What would be the worst case scenario for the landing? How are scientists preparing should something go wrong? Well, there have been missions to Mars that have been unsuccessful. Um, only about one in every three missions to Mars is successful. Um, sometimes, like the Beagle, um, which was sent by the Europeans, they crash. Um, we also had a mission where, um, unfortunately, they got confused between um, inches, centimeters, and metric, and it also crashed. Um, and sometimes the missions uh, don't land they kind of fly on by so one of the the two of those would probably the worst case scenario we've got missions that are orbiters that hopefully will watch um the landing the edl so they will know and it's got all kinds of cameras so we're prepared as much as possible and i guess the the best thing is to figure out what went wrong um, and see if we can see where it crashed like they did with the Beagle on Mars with this was one of the orbiters. Hopefully that won't won't be won't be the um, scenario, but um, we're, we're ready and waiting. So what is the reason behind such an extended timeline for um, the rover being on Mars and the samples that they've collected being sent back? I think you said it would be 2026 before the samples would leave Mars. Is that correct? And I'm just wondering, yeah. like, you, you can only easily get to Mars every two years or so. Um, and some not every two years are, are the, the same because some years are Mars is favorable opposition, so it's a little bit closer than others. And so it, it just takes time. And we don't know how we're going to collect the samples and, and send them back to Earth right now. Exactly. They're working on a 2024 mission and a 2026 mission and what they're going to do, but they don't know exactly how this is going to happen. All we can do right now is cache them and hope we can find them in, in uh, five years. Do you know, um, I imagine the plans once the samples are collected and received back on Earth would just be to study them, but do they have any other types of plans. We're part of the Lunar and Meteorite Sample Lending Program. Um, so we're actually able to borrow those samples from the Johnson Space Center. And I didn't know if, you know, if these would ever go on that kind of docket. Yeah, I, I can't get them because they don't have the certifications right now due to COVID. It has to be in person, they said. But yes, I had to go to Denver to get my certification. Yeah, they don't do that anymore. Mine expired long ago. Um, once they the samples are returned to Earth, anybody can request one um, worldwide. Mostly, I think I think all of it is going to be research at first, just like the lunar rock samples at first. They started now. I don't know if you've seen. You can get a uh, that the um, White House has a has an Apollo rock sitting in the Oval Office right now. And NASA has started um, 
where libraries and museums can actually get a, um, an Apollo rock sample for exhibit. Um, and we're trying to get one of those, but that has to be hand carried from Houston and just a lot of grief. It's always stressful to me when we borrow the samples. It's yeah, a little fun, we'll, but we'll so much stress. I don't know if they still do, but um, they used to be okay by um, certified mail, registered mail. You could just ship them in the mail. They, that's how the uh, lunar and meteorite samples come from the Johnson Space Center, just in their regular mail. Um, and that's how I send them back. So. Oh, my goodness. And with the mail being so slow, I, I just, it freaks me. But um, yeah, the, um, the exhibit rocks have to be hand carried. And okay. it's on a need to know basis. I saw where, I read where the United Arab Emirates has sent something to Mars. Has it landed or is it on the way? And will it interfere with us? It is an orbiter and it will never land. It will orbit like we've got about five missions orbiting as well, and it will not interfere. Um, it, I don't think it has reached orbit yet. It is going to soon though, if it hasn't already by April, it will be orbiting. Um, and maybe it'll take pictures of us. So we have a question in the chat from Catherine who wants to know, what's the price tag of this mission? I don't know. I really don't know. That's a good question. Um, it is expensive. Um, NASA has various um, price tags for the various missions. And because it's preparing for humans and it's got some approved concepts like the MOXIE for oxygen, it's on the most expensive tier. Whenever we borrow the lunar and meteorite samples and we like deal with like show kids them, I always ask the question, I was like, what do you think these samples are worth? And they get really excited and go crazy and try to name these giant numbers. And then when I explain that they're actually priceless because of the scientists who gave their lives um, to help us go to the moon to get the samples, it kind of gives them a whole new concept to, to how much these missions actually cost in regard to something different than dollars. So. They, they are priceless kind of there's over 800 pounds of them on earth and you can occasionally get them on ebay each state was given two so there's a hundred there and a lot of heads of each united states state so alabama has two um some of those were lost and um there were a number of heads of state, including some dictators that got one. So um, some of those can be available on the market. So they're not exactly priceless, but there, if people did give their lives. And right now there are, there is only 800 pounds on earth and most of that is locked away. Does anyone else have any questions for Carol? I just want to remind y'all that tomorrow we have our final uh, event leading up to the lunar, I mean, the rover landing. It's going to be tomorrow at one o'clock on Zoom. You can register and we'll send you the Zoom information out as well. Carol, I want to say thank you again for coming out. We're going to um, record this and we'll put it on YouTube and I will send out the recording soon in a couple of days. And I'll probably actually send you the recording of the other two events that we've had as well. That way you can watch them all or share them all out. So everyone, thank you so much for coming today. I hope you stay safe and warm and have a great Tuesday. It's Tuesday, yes. Thank you. Bye everyone, take care. Hi everyone.